All right. Well, and we're going to get started and dive into our tips. We're going to cover um, what works on Instagram and especially um, like ways to be creative with it so it doesn't feel like everybody's doing the same photos all the time. We're going to talk about flattering angles, the outfit of the day shots. We're going to go into a little bit on lighting, changing perspectives, how to take the perfect selfie, a little bit of editing tips. And then, and then we're going to also hit influencer tricks, things that influencers do, flat lay imagery, which is those great overhead shots, controlling light, and some other small technique things. So without further ado, tip number one. Tip number one is lighting is everything. So today we're going to talk to you guys about the three different kinds of the best types of light. So the first kind of light that we want to talk to you guys about is window light. Um, this is different kind of natural light that comes through the windows. Um, for example, this room has very little light, natural light at all. So we always love to move ourselves towards the image, or sorry, towards the lighting when we're taking an image. So if you're in the back corner of a room and there's not very good light, or you want to take a flat lay or some sort of image, always think about, okay, where's the light and where can I get natural light because it'll be the most flattering on my skin. So move yourself towards the natural light as much as possible. So in this space, moving towards this window would help a little, but what would help a lot mm -hmm. is moving outside. There's huge, beautiful windows right next to that front entrance that have really beautiful filtered light coming in. So um, she sort of mentioned this yeah. too, especially if you're photographing a product or fat, flat lay imagery in a store or a, even a model in a dress or something like that. Instead of staying near the dressing room or where the product mm -hmm. is, is stationed in the store, we recommend moving it all the way up to that window, get it capturing that pretty light. The second type of lighting that is also really helpful for this type of imagery is open shade. Um, you may have seen this before and not realized what it was, but it's a big, if, like you imagine a tall building that at noonday the light's really bright, but there's still maybe like a slight shadow cast, like a little triangle of shadow. Getting into that light is really flattering because the light's going to be bouncing around everywhere else, but you're in the shade, so none of that harsh lighting is hitting you or the product. The third there. The last kind of light we love is cloudy daylight. So in Los Angeles, we don't always get a lot of cloudy days, sadly. I mean, I'm not complaining, but for <laughs> us photography lovers, cloudy daylight is a really great kind of lighting to capture. So it really kind of filters the light, makes it very sparkly. So if you notice some clouds and you're like, oh, run outside right now, let's take a quick photo of something. Um, that kind of light will be very, very flattering on the skin and in the photos. Mm -hmm. And it makes like a really creamy texture. So we'll point here to some of the Im images that we have. Um, this was we did for a luxury travel brand of Travel Basics. And so they wanted to shoot it at a vintage airport. And we actually really lucked out that it was a cloudy day that day because otherwise we would be overcoming all this like really bright light out in the sun with the airplanes. But you can see how her skin tone looks incredibly smooth. There's no ed we don't edit most of our photos in post. We do some light color correction, but it's just if you capture it with the right kind of lighting, then you. Less is more. <laughs> you don't need to. Edit. This one you can see is open shade. The building is casting the shadow, and then the light actually draws a line right here. So she would have been yeah. just a little bit to the left. She would have been in that really bright, harsher light that's a little more difficult to mm -hmm. manipulate. And here, that's me sitting at a coffee shop. <laughs> the window is there, so you can see the soft light just kind of creating really pleasant shadows as it goes across. Cool. Well, Any questions? Yeah. What about the significance of sunset or even sunrise? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So actually, this one here um, is at golden hour, which you'll hear photographers yeah. gush about a lot. <laughs> that is, if you have the option of scheduling your shoot or when you're shooting something, golden hour happens twice a day. It's in the morning at sunrise. Most people aren't up that early, so then sunset is the one that everybody utilizes. Golden hour is when you get this lens flare. See this like light coming through because once the light gets low enough in the horizon you can turn your camera so it faces into that light source and it's going to refract in the lens so you're going to get that pleasant mm -hmm. lens flare that warm glowy orangey yellowish warmth that uh, happens so the other thing is that golden hour is one of the few times a day where your subject can face directly into the light and it's actually really pleasing on the mm -hmm. skin tone yeah cool we're going to go into the next tip which is and tip number two, lighting is controllable. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, you know, in that first tip, we were talking about the natural, how it's naturally occurring, but you can manipulate it to be the kind of light that you need. So we're gonna talk about number one is looking for natural reflectors. Mm -hmm. This is a big tip that you actually, a lot of major photographers never work with any kind of lighting equipment, any kind of like bouncy things. They just look for natural reflectors in their scene. So for example, this first image that we're using here, this is again at golden hour. You can see the sunset is actually behind her coming through the light uh, through the buildings in downtown LA. Which pop over just a little bit mm -hmm. so you can see there. And what's actually out of the scene that you don't see is I am standing here 
and there's a huge glass building behind me, and that glass building is bouncing the sunset oh. back at her face and illuminating her hair. Another reflector in the scene is this water. So if she was close to the edge of the water, the light would be bouncing up at her face and filling in any shadows that might be there. Mm -hmm. um, other reflectors to look for would be a white building, like something painted white, a car yeah. window. Like it's funny how sometimes the car makes this like spotlight that is like beautiful and pleasing. Um, so looking for natural reflectors is a really great way to kind of elevate the image. It can create more contrast or it can soften skin tone, things like that. Another thing we love to do is creating our own mini reflectors. So maybe you don't actually own a reflector like a photographer would, but what you could actually do is just take a piece of white paper or a white poster board and create your own reflector. Um, this is what's happening in the second image here. So Kat and I do a lot of flat lay shoots and we'll go over what flat lays are in a second. But um, you can see here that the window light's being brought in and being reflected off of the white canvas of the poster board. So it's actually creating even more bright light just on the objects and kind of eliminating, eliminating some of the shadows in, around, in and around the food. So it creates a much more even photo, um, a much more brighter photo, and it kind of just illuminates everything in the image. Yeah, it softens and fills in the shadows, which we call a high key. It kind of just like elevates mm -hmm. everything, makes it feel happier. Um, brighter, lighter, mm -hmm. and that's for a lot of people's Instagram feeds, and especially brands, that's actually a really uh, popular aesthetic to have. The third one we're gonna talk about here is diffusing the light. This one's a little bit trickier, as you can see. In this image, they're holding up what we call a scrim, but if you wanna do this on your own, um, say if you're in a, a setting where there's enough, no option but really bright sunlight, um, you can grab actually like a the kind of thinner white sheet. Mm -hmm. You can grab even if it's a small enough subject paper and you're just going to elevate it and hold it up so that the sun is going to or the bright light is going to pass through that and it's going to soften it and create those pleasant lights. And actually makes often a really warm color tone mm -hmm. too which can be really really pretty. The last thing to control the light is to rotate your subject. So um, you, whenever we see light we always assume like just look directly into the light and then take a photo but that's not always the best and most flattering for people's faces so if you just hold up your hand you can see the light hitting my hand a certain way here but if you move your hand you can start seeing the shadows change so you can kind of see how the light's going to change on your object as you move it and rotate it so just like in this photo here the sun is actually behind him but by rotating him it gives this really cool shadow on this side of his body that you maybe wouldn't have thought of doing um, without actually figuring out how to rotate and shape the light. Yeah, without experimenting. Mm -hmm. And that brings us actually into tip number three of experimentation, Yay. which is my favorite, which is play with perspective. And you can highlight different features of things by experimenting with where the camera is and where your subject is. So the first thing that we love to do is get low. <laughs> get low. Um, get low. <laughs> get low. Um, so the first thing that we always, I love this one and Kat knows this. I'm yeah. like, Kat, will you please get low? Um, <laughs> well, because honestly, if you want to look a little bit leaner, if you want to highlight the best features um, and you're taking an outfit shot, getting low really helps to do that. So in this photo, Kat's on the ground and our model, who's already like, you know, five foot eight, five foot, maybe mm -hmm. she's taller than that. Yeah. Um, she's already very tall, but this really gives it a very pleasing look so that the overall outfit looks extremely elongated. She looks like even more of an Amazonian woman and that will help a lot in a lot of cases to make you look taller, leaner, and more flattering. And I know we're that, that's a very woman-centric thing to say, yeah. <laughs> to look leaner, taller, elongated, but in the male perspective of this as well, as getting low creates the hero shot. Mm -hmm. If you guys have seen that before, like cover of magazines where, um, like Newsweek has done it a ton where it feels very, like they feel very heroic and tall, it's because the camera angle is low. Mm -hmm. So it can make the subject feel bigger and more um, powerful. And then the, my uh, second tip here is get higher. So we always say get low for the body, get high for the face. So when we're taking pictures of, some, of people's face, like I would say like 80% of people look better from a high angle. So it's a more like automatically flattering and this is because of like the camera compression. Um, and so it's a great little tip there. It also can really give a new perspective if you kind of take that to the extremes and get really high, which is where we talk about breaking the rules. So we love to break the rule. So especially here in the last image, you can see we're taking a flat lay shot. If you were actually sitting there and just took it in the angle that you saw, you'd be sitting there right across from the coffee and just take a picture this way. But we all know that that's not always the best angle to take things from. So we love to break the rules and kind of go extremely high or overhead and especially true for flat lay. So kind of experiment, feel free to take the reins and kind of um, challenge yourself to think of the image in a very new way. 
um, yeah, just like we do. Today. And I think the the extension of that too is it's not just get high either. It's not just go overhead, yeah. but it's look before you take the shot. Look around, like get mm -hmm. your camera out and start looking like and play with angle, play yeah. with composition, and see what kind of speaks to you in that moment. All right, number four. This is the rule of thirds. Has anybody in this room heard of the rule of thirds before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you've ever gone to design or art school or even taken a very basic class, you've heard this. So we like to take this old school rule and have a modern twist on it. So you can see this image. This is, for the most part, compositionally, a very traditional rule of thirds, right? Mm -hmm. She's right on the crosshair. We love it. It's very uh, pleasant. gives us a ton of negative space to the side. We've broken this rule a little bit, though, by not just having a main perspective, but using tip number three, and we got really, really low. So I'm shot, this is shot from way down on the streets of New York, so it makes her again feel heroic, makes her feel really lean, and makes her feel grand in the scene. So that's And something doing. you can do with the rule of thirds is you can actually turn on the grid on your phone um, so that you can see this grid on your phone when you're taking a photo, which is really helpful on the iPhone that they allow you to do that, and nobody really has that turned on. But by turning that on, then you can actually play with, oh, okay, the horizon is right there. I don't want the horizon to be directly in the center of the screen. Let me move it to be a little bit lower or a little mm -hmm. bit higher. Um, it gives you a little bit more direction if you turn on that feature. Yes. I, I was going to say, where is this grid Yeah, feature? it's hidden, so it's in your settings. It, yeah. We can all go there if you guys want to see it because yeah. it is a little buried. Um, <coughs> let me find out. It's in your settings mm -hmm. under center camera, right? Let's see. Mm -hmm. I think it is. Turned it on in a while. <laughs> but it's in camera? It's in, I believe it's in camera. Do you do you find the let me see. Oh I think right now I found it. You found it? Okay. Yeah, Tell everybody you scroll where it down is. to the bottom near the bottom and there's a there's an on off switch uh, that says grid. So I guess look at it. It says photos in camera and then in there it's like right. grid. Yeah, right yep. here. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. It. Yeah. 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 Perfect. So yeah, so you can have that grid on or off. It's great if you're especially trying to like reteach yourself to think outside of this and pay attention to those. It's really nice to have it on the screen. Yes. So what is the rule? <laughs> okay. So the rule of thirds is that um, oh, yeah, asymmetry is pleasing, especially when it's in uh, like perfect thirds. You know, the the symbiosis, uh, the synchronicity of thirds. So generally, the rule is to align both thirds. So this would be obviously one of the third lines. Oh, I like that it just dinged for me when I touched it. <laughs> and then this is another vertical third. So by putting her subject, the subject the, where you want the viewer's attention to go to, right on that crosshair, that's a traditional placement of the rule of thirds. So now let's go to this next slide and you can see this is non-traditional placement. Especially when we're talking subjects. Like a lot of people mm -hmm. think of rule of thirds in terms of taking a sunset photo, skyline photo, things like that, because as Kate mentioned, the horizon line is easy to see in a sunset photo, right? So most people would naturally put a sunset right horizon right in the middle, but by moving it down or up, it, it is pleasant to the eye. But when we're talking about taking a photo of a subject instead of a scene, um, this is where we're talking about the non-traditional placement. So you can see on this, she's not in the middle, but she's also not on the crosshair. She's kind of this slight asymmetry here, but her head is right on that third line. So you can see it creates this like really, really grand scene. You guys all know this place is a bro downtown LA. And if we were to take a more normal close-up image of her, we would kind of lose the grandiosity of this building. You would lose some of the perspective that makes it feel bigger and powerful. Mm -hmm. And so we call this a super wide image because it gives this opportunity for people to really take everything in and still have their attention drawn to where we want it, which is the subject. Mm -hmm. We kind of did the same here. So this is another non-traditional rule of thirds where she's kind of in the center middle of the bottom photo or the bottom part of the photo. Um, and this just is another way to present a really different perspective. Um, something else that can make this even more dramatic <laughs> is if we had cropped it and taken the photo right here. So just her eyes were peeking out. And then it's really just like a little bit of mm -hmm. action there and the rest of the photo is really showcasing the environment of the photo. It gives you the chance to be playful is what this is. And I guess you're, if you're working, creating images and then giving them to someone else to do design with, by creating some of these playful images, it gives them more room to be creative and play. So it's kind of part of a great asset to team building there. 
Okay. Oh yeah, Kate's forte. Tip number five <laughs> is how to take a selfie without it looking like a selfie, which we all kind of want to know. And even if you don't want to know it, I know secretly you want to know and you just want to admit it out loud. So the first step in taking the perfect selfie is knowing your angle. I hear so many people say, oh, I just can't take a selfie or I have, I have no idea because they take a selfie and they, it just isn't their best angle. So the, the first thing that we always recommend is practicing your angle. and. Don't be um, shy about it. So practice it a lot and a lot and a lot until you find the perfect angle that's best for your features. So we do this all the time. Yeah. You get your arm up, you take a lot of different photos until you find the exact angle that's the most flattering for your face. The second thing to, and this is actually what's gonna give you the ability to mm -hmm. experiment with angle is the selfie hold. Does <laughs> anybody know the selfie hold? Okay, so most people, you hold your phone like this. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. That's kind of standard, right? Your hand, all fingers across the back. Okay, the selfie hold is gonna change your life, get ready. Your pinky goes underneath. Especially when you have a big phone like this, it's kind of essential. Your fingers wrap around the back and your front one stabilizes here. So your oh. thumb is free now and I can hold it yes. at almost any angle it. and I'm not yes, gonna drop it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, because if you're trying to hold it like this, your thumb needs to be free to take that foot like you're going to drop it. And some people have, there's the great little um, accessories you can get for your phone. There's like a loop that I've used at different times. There's like a little plunger thing yeah. that's really popular right now. <laughs> so you can also, if you have a hard time with it, get one of those accessories. But the hold is really life changing. So that pinky mm -hmm. across the bottom, the finger across the front, and then you basically have your thumb free to take here. And then what this does differently is because another type of selfie technique is to use these side buttons, which, which work as um, shutter releases. You can do this, but you get a little, like you're losing about two or three inches of extension. And some people need that I extension. Like the oh, I need that That's extension the and I need the angle. So as you can see, playing with the angle, know you're going to be, most people, like I said earlier, 85% of people are going to look best at a high angle. Yes, girl, it's great. Back there. But not, yeah, you're nailing it right now. Nailing <laughs> And oh, you're doing all yeah, the ones we're getting, getting it all. Advanced class, we're getting it all. I'm like, this is hard. <laughs> There's going to be a test at the end. Exactly. Yes. Test on uh, so, like I was saying, 85% of people really look better from above, but I'm one of the, the people who looks better from below. So, I always flip my hair over my shoulder, I put my camera at a low angle, and I lean into it. And then I take my selfie, and that's what creates this image here. And it doesn't look like I'm leaning forward but it's the best light for the nature of the angles on my face. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, so I would say 90% of my selfies look like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, something we also love to mention is finding the good light. So this also kind of goes in with knowing your angle, but once you know your angle, you want to find your good light. So let's look in this room, okay? Mm -hmm. If I was just to take a picture like this, there'd be going to be a lot of shadows because this light is really hard. Actually, it's we're going to take one. Okay. Yeah, let's take one right here. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's how that turned out. It's not, we probably would not post this one. Like, let's be honest, it's not flattering, right? The light is awful mm -hmm. in our face. But if we turn around to this amazing screen because it's providing some really bright light and mm -hmm. then suddenly we take a selfie. Now you can see the difference. Um, Suddenly, just by using that light source instead of just the overhead light source, the shadows have disappeared from our face. It's a lot brighter and crisper, and we look a lot more flattering. And you know, we love natural lights. We're we're total natural light advocates. But sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you can't go anywhere. Say uh, there's a celebrity in the room, and you want to like, want to meet them, and you want to take a selfie with them. That's your only opportunity. Be like, no, just turn around this way. We're gonna get it. And find it's like look for the good light. Play with it on your phone, like experiment before you're in the moment being like, where is that good light? Yes. Mm -hmm. What about this? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lumi cases, but this actually... Oh, we love Lumi cases. Yeah, it's yeah. great light. So yeah. you can buy accessories. There's the Lumi cases. There's attachable lights. And you yeah. can use the built-in. This is actually a really great trick of mm -hmm. ours. If you have two phones accessible to you, one mm -hmm. is going to be the camera. The other one is going to be your light. So she's taking the selfie oh, of yes. us. as we always do this, yeah. She's taking the selfie of us and I'm lighting us. <laughs> it feels funny, but when you get like when you really want to take a photo in a dark but situation, it it's life changing because mm -hmm. you're like, I don't understand. <laughs> also, you can hand <laughs> the light to somebody else and be like, hold this high and shine it at us. Mm -hmm. And it really does. It makes a big difference. Um, some fun little 
Tricks. Okay, turn off. The last thing we love to do with taking a selfie is a lot of people just look directly at the camera, but that can be a little bit intense sometimes. So something I love to do is looking away from the camera. So for example, how we took this middle photo, we are looking at the camera and suddenly we're like, yay, And you. so then you just um, hold it in alignment, to look at the alignment, and then look away. And it just put, creates a more playful image. So that's how we did the second image in the middle. All right, we're nailing it through selfies. I feel really good about it. I feel like you guys really enjoy that part. <laughs> <laughs> So we're gonna change it up with tip number six. Mm -hmm. And these are two of the most underutilized image categories um, and how you can apply them to a brand. The first is flat lays, which is my favorite. So flat lays can work whether you're an influencer or a brand. Um, they're a different kind of image that helps to kind of space out the model images that you have on your Instagram. So flat lays, to define that, it's products that are neatly aligned um, in an eye-pleasing fashion with a, you know, a lighter, brighter background. So in all the images on the left are all, oh sorry, I'm putting the screen here, are all flat light images. Um, and what you want to look for when you're creating a flat lay is one, a lot of even spacing between objects, so nothing too clustered and too um, confusing um, and chaotic. And then look for different uh, textures below your objects that are light, bright, and also create something different and eye-pleasing. So here in the first top image, you'll see that we use a marble board just versus a white canvas to create some interesting texture in the background. Here, this is actually a white fuzzy rug that we use, so that creates just a different kind of texture than you would experience with just a white board underneath. Um, these are also different kinds of detail flat lay shots that we love to include as well. So try to be a little bit creative and remember always just going back to lighting to be very cognizant of the light in your flat lay image. So if you have direct lighting above, Keep in mind that if you're going above your image to take that flat lay shot that you may cast some shadows. So you want to be always cognizant of how you're taking the photo and where the light is coming from on your flat lay shot. Also, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. as easy as they look. <laughs> they look very seamless here, but this was very hard to Yeah, play. but we're masters, so we got <laughs> we're really good at them now. But um, you might want to take some of these as inspiration and try recreating them. And then as you get comfortable with the idea, you can experiment more and, and play with different ideas. We always say create a shot list. It makes it a yeah. lot easier for yourself if you want to create flat lay images. Take a lot of different kinds that you're like, oh, I want to recreate that, and then actually try to recreate that exact shot. So the second category that we're going to talk about here is the lifestyle category. And just like we were talking about earlier, taking selfies or taking pictures of faces and people, it's also important for brands to represent the lifestyle for their consumer to see themselves on the feed. They want to feel very relate, like they can relate to that lifestyle. So think about who your consumer is and then pinpoint some of the things that they might do. Some great options are to take shots of coffee lattes, which are really popular, flowers, um, sunsets, you know, different vistas of different kinds, different environmental type scenes mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, your consumer might see on a day-to-day -day basis and acknowledge that that's really beautiful and admire and have that like aspirational draw to have that kind of a lifestyle. Something so it both simultaneously inspires them and invites them in. Mm -hmm. So it's really mm -hmm. simple. Yeah. And then tip number seven, our last tip is our, some of our key editing tips to transform your image. So as you know, you can take an image, but it actually can look totally different just by editing it. So we're gonna just walk you through a few before and afters. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at this first photo here, this is just a flat lay shot of you know a work and coffee scene. Um, and looking here on the left, the before, you can see that there's a bit of a yellow cast up here from the overhead lighting. You can see the reflecting of the light. It just looks a little bit dull and dingy and not exactly something I would wanna post on my feed. So when we edited it, we took away all of that yellow, we kind of made it whiter, brighter, crisper, we increased the highlights. So the after effect is this beautiful white and crisp image that is much more eye-pleasing to use in a feed. So we recommend an app um, because we're minimalists, we like all-in-one things. So we have just mm -hmm. one app that we use, which is called uh, Mosaic, sorry, <laughs> not Snapseed, I keep wanting to say the wrong name. So what it looks like is I'm just going to grab one of those selfies we just took. So we have this selfie here and say because of the two different colors of lighting in here, so the overhead lighting is creating like a yellow cast behind us, but this is creating like a prettier blue light, we might want to take some of that yellow down a bit so that we can utilize this image. So there's like a little tool in here. We love, our two favorites are both brush and selective, but we'll grab the brush tool here. We're going to go to saturation and drop it down to negative five. And then I'm literally just going to paint on the areas that I want desaturated. 
so that it brings all the attention in to where we want it to be and takes it away from that yellow cast behind us. And overall, you can see before and after, it just like elevates the image a little bit. Yep, now it's all So, fine. weird yellowy light that's <laughs> And that happens, that's the same thing that happened in this scene is there was mm -hmm. window light was our primary light, but there were overhead lights that were giving this yellow cast. So, we, we basically did that same thing with the brush tool and we just like painted in with our finger to like erase all of that yellow cast with mm -hmm. the desaturation brush. Same thing happens here. We brightened up. We used actually a different tool in there, Selective, to elevate these shadows here and lift them so they were less distracting. And same thing here, this um, French napkin was perfect for our little scene, but it was a little too yellow. So same thing, we just painted down and elevated the color of the scene. Yeah. So that's basically the gist of things. You can do a lot inside of that editing tool, Snapseed. There's mm -hmm. a ton of other things that we do, um, but what, we also love it because it gives tutorials in there so it can help you kind of learn and experiment. And a lot of people use the app Facetune, and we just like to kind of steer away from that app as much as possible. Um, there are a few good things that Facetune does, but Snapseed is way more usable and offers a lot of the same exact features, but way more. So we like yeah. to tell people that that's it's like a mini Photoshop or Lightroom for your phone. And, and to so. that same end, actually, we are not fans of filters. We try to recommend people that you should control the light yourself and not have a filter do it for you. Mm -hmm. And so you can utilize all those settings inside of that app to kind of create your aesthetic and make it consistent from image to image. Yeah, I should also mention if you have, uh, and most you probably don't, but if you do have the Adobe Creative Cloud membership, oh, yeah. you, you get all lightning. these additional apps as well. They're just included. A lot of people don't realize they exist, but they're out there. There's mm -hmm. tons of That's them. Awesome. Photoshop, yeah. Lightroom Express, things like that. That's so awesome. We actually are Lightroom users. It's pretty mm -hmm. central to our business. Um, and they, the mobile app, actually, we have our team are able to call our imagery and do some basic edits to it to kind of put down on our workload. Um, why aren't you fans of filters? Like, what do you find is, like, the pro or the con of doing What we that? find is, is not the filters themselves, is people's excessive use of them mm -hmm. and reliance on them. And mm -hmm. so that's why we're, it's not that we think filters are bad by any means. They actually can be really useful, and there are times where we use them. But as a general rule, we want people to be in control of what they're doing to their image instead of just tapping on filters and seeing what happens, you know? And a filter is a very, it's a preset uh, settings for all those different things. So warmth and the highlights and the shadows. And it's great to be able to learn and understand those things up front so you can control it more. So you can um, apply it to the whole picture. Yeah. You can apply what you need to that part. Yes, and there's something yeah. great about Snapseed too is like if you don't want to just, if you don't want to brighten the entire image, you just want to brighten one area of the image that's really dull and dingy and maybe darker, you can be very selective and brighten just that part of the image or change the color of just that part of the image instead of impacting yeah. the whole photo. Okay. That and it, it gives you the opportunity to bring the attention to where you want it instead of the filter just doing like a blanket treatment. Okay, mm -hmm. so. cool. But some people find a happy balance and happy medium between the two, which also can be really great. So it's not that filters are, you should never touch them, but just we want you to be empowered to be able to control them and have the ability to change what you want in the image. All right, so that brings us to the end. Uh, we are going to take questions and like, I and we'll be here, so, no, so here. feel free to ask away. What do you guys do when it's windy outside? Oh yeah. So wind is definitely <laughs> yeah. a challenge, especially the last two days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple tricks for wind. Um, primarily, I you always want to have backup locations, atriums, like that window up there where you're inside, but there's all that beautiful natural light. Um, any kind of like you should just have a list of backup places that are enclosed with beautiful natural light. Um, and same then goes for rain. Same thing goes for rain. Yeah, um, but. A little less, like if you don't have an atrium accessible, some other things you can look for are kind of alcoves, um, alleys, different areas where the wind is blocked. Look for where it's coming from. Uh, and then the other thing too is just not being in open space. So kind of like if even if you're not totally tucked away, if you're against a wall, the wind most likely is going to be a little more diffused. But then the lighting. Well, no, so the open shade that we talked about mm -hmm. is perfect. That's like a perfect combination of those things. So if you look, it's a sunny day, but it's windy. Look for open shade and put them against the wall. Versus it's being not, in It's not sunny. It's, then, then you have more options. You're still against the wall, but you get that natural, like, cloudy, diffused, silvery Sparkly. light. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of each rule, like, can play in and of itself on its own, or you can combine them all together. And it is. It's when you get a particularly challenging situation, and that's, like, the perfect time to test, like, okay, which one of these rules am I not thinking about? Yeah. What can I, how can I think outside the box? Um, even playing with perspective, you may want to 
totally change things up and attempt to use some artificial lighting, like using, you know, a good room that happens to have a really beautiful blue light of some sort, so some sort in it. <clears throat> Any other questions? What, yeah. about, what about flash, particularly as it relates? Mm. Don't. You know, you're, in a, you're in a restaurant, you have a group yeah. of friends, right. you're trying to take a good picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was that, that flashlight technique. So we don't like flash, we like flashlight. So it's always, if well, you okay, have two so phones, yeah, have right. somebody, because a professional photographer will tell you all this time, get the flash off the camera. Yeah. So if you move it away from where the subject is and away from where the camera is, it's going to create more interesting light. So angled to a side, elevated high, not straight in front of you, like this isn't the prettiest thing you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And even doing this as straight overhead, that's not pretty either. So it's, but you give it an angle and it definitely, you can see how that changes as you move it around. Especially when you're with multiple people, this is like if you're in a group setting, like get, there's multiple phones. So get multiple flashlights, have the waiters hold them on the side, mm -hmm. and then someone take the photo in the center. The, 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 problem, the problem is, you know, the key is, and I'll tell you a little story in a second, is you don't, especially in a fine dining restaurant, you don't want it to look too obvious that you're taking food photography. Because I yeah. do a lot of food photography. Mm -hmm. And this is why I got the Lumi, because, in, uh, you know, the plus is it has the backlight and the front lights, like 80 yeah. bucks. Yeah. And you know, of course, you can write it off or whatever. But <laughs> basically, it allows you like to turn it when you get to the backlight setting. You basically just take it right through the dark restaurant. Boom! You've got the picture. Yeah, that's great. And like you know, but like you know, the one thing you don't want to do is you want it to look like you know so obvious, you know, and true on people's you know, because like there's some restaurants yeah, that won't even let you take food true, photography. They'll true. pick you out. This yeah. is true. And last year, uh, my girlfriend and I, we were in, uh, speaking of New York, we were in La Bernadette, which is really fancy high end. And she was really, you know, she really didn't want me to take food pictures there, but you know, that's what my job is. So I literally, this is what I had to do, had to do seriously. We wait for each, if you've been to La Bernadette or something like it's multi-course, they bring like several courses at your, at your table every about 20 minutes or whatever. Anyway, you go down here and then they bring the course up. And as soon as they do, you go right to the food shop, boom, bend right back down. <laughs> and you know, she was so satisfied until, she, until, until she saw other people taking pictures too, and then she was. Oh, wait a minute, they're doing okay. it as well. Okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's two approaches. If you're in a place where you're going to get kicked out, you got to be low key. So get right. the tools. There are a ton of accessories you can get. Mm -hmm. Lumi is a great option. And then there's some other, like, you can buy independent little lights that you can mm -hmm. set to the side and different little things. Um, but also, don't be, we live in LA, so like you can take pictures of your food if you see us, if you see two blondes in a restaurant like this. That is probably, probably us. <laughs> Hold the phone, everyone. Don't eat yet. We're yeah. here. <laughs> and the people that you're around too, we find that actually this is, it comes up a lot. Like how do you do it without being disruptive? And the reality is, is if you just tell people, like when you order your food, be like, hey, by the way, when the food gets here, do you mind if I take a quick shot really quick? It'll be like one minute, two minutes max. People, most people are fine. Yeah, and and fine. as long as they know it's coming, if they're like about to take a bite and you're like stop I'm gonna get the picture you're like they're gonna be mad at you so, <laughs> so yeah have a little uh you know respect for that and the reality is if you're taking the photo tagging them on Instagram the restaurant wants you to do it yeah. most yeah. of the time right. so it's go like ahead and own it yeah, yeah. Actually, new place. yeah. Like everybody like, wants yeah it's, it's, it's funny a, how the rules it's a different kind of marketing now it doesn't matter yeah. if you have like 20 yeah. followers to like 2,000 followers or I mean mm -hmm. 200,000 yeah, followers not to let you take a yeah yeah, yeah. We were, Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I was, I was going to a side, a side topic, so if you want to go. No, okay, okay so I was going to say, I, well, I was in New Orleans uh, for my birthday this past February. We went to August, which is like, again, fine dining, John Bash, mm -hmm. really great place if you go. And the waiter was this really great character, and he, he actually described all the dishes of the, of the entree every time a new plate came out. He did this really long oh, description. Nice. Yeah, oh, wow. And I could, of course, I knew I couldn't remember it, so I actually, not just I took the picture, I recorded his comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, come back to them later in the night. He's wondering what I'm doing, and I'm trying to explain it to him. Oh, you're not gonna like put that online or anything. I said, no, I'm just using it as a reference, but mm -hmm. the descriptions are really cool if you want to hear them later. It's mm -hmm. like they're really good. Well, and honestly, Very too, in terms of like capturing the experience, that's actually, we talk all about imagery here, but another form of imagery is video. And a lot of these rules apply in the exact same way. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very Instagram centric, so we do a lot of Insta stories. Same thing though, mm -hmm. we'll apply to the new Facebook stories, to mm -hmm. Snapchat, and all that kind of stuff is that. Don't just take a photo, like don't just capture the moment, capture the stuff that surrounds it, create the life, like let people into the opportunity, especially mm -hmm. if you're partnering with another brand, like, and like we talked about even in the imagery, the, the consumer wants to feel part of the life. 
And so by inviting them in, by giving them the window, capturing the waiter as he brings it out, doing a beautiful, they're like flumbing it, lighting it on fire or something. Like have the camera ready and, and capture it in a 10 or 15 second clip and make that part of the beautiful image that you post as well. And it creates the story. Yeah. yeah. Storytelling is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. You had a question. Uh, yeah. So my question was, do you have any suggestions for capturing kids or action yes. shots that might be going a little bit mm -hmm. less yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to refer to Kat because she's a photographer. I'm like, I don't know. What that and I have 13 nieces and nephews. So mm -hmm. I'm familiar. <laughs> so first thing is volume is your friend. Mm -hmm. um, also note, noting that if you're using an iPhone or something similar, that if you just hold the button down, it's going to take like 50. All of them. So it'll just go rapid fire. Right. Also turn off live view, the live, you know, the live image because it takes longer, so it'll be, if they're fast movers and they can't sit still, live, every single one's gonna be blurry. So turn that off. Same thing with HDR. What's HDR what's could be really what's great. What's the reason for live view? Live view is a fun little thing that only works on an iPhone where it kind of creates like a motion image, yeah. so, but it's barely, it like captures the moment right before and the moment right after. So it's like a slightly moving image, which, it can be really cool. Can yeah, it not even? But it's it's. I feel like where we are right now, that's they're not shareable. I'll, you can yeah, only show people on your phone. Like, I would I would want to like post the little live view that you can't. But you can't. It's really it's just fun for you. Yeah, it's more for you for showing time. someone on your phone and or on your computer because it is compatible with Mac products, uh, all Apple products. But we're, we're actually right. more. I know. I'm like I feel bad if we didn't say it. <laughs> but um, I feel like right now, what's the more applicable form of that is the boomerang. Uh, so a move like a slightly longer moving image or, or gif type gif gif type image where it has like probably anywhere from five to ten frames that they're capturing mm -hmm. um, synced together. That again for kids, boomerangs are great because then you get their personality in it. Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. other element is bright light. So when the thing to know about your phone is when the light is lower, it has to think more. It has to figure out like how it's going to make all this work. And in low light, one of the tricks it uses to capture that is it opens the shutter for longer. And anyone who knows a little bit about camera, for, like the way a camera works is when the shutters open, if the subject moves, it's going to blur. blur. So those are kind of the things. Um, I would give you two more tips. Get low, <laughs> get low, get low. Because kids are little and so adults have a natural tendency to capture them from above. But then you're seeing the adult perspective. What can be really cool is get low, get on their level, see what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and don't just take a picture of them. Take a picture of them in their scene and how they're living, what they're doing, what they're like over their shoulder as they're playing with a toy and kind of ex exploring that mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. perspective thing, it comes back mm -hmm. into what we talk about a lot because perspective really is one of the quickest ways you can change. Like if you feel like your images are repetitive, Playing with your perspective is going to change things mm -hmm. really fast. So, looking at things a new way, turning it around, moving the subject, moving yourself. Um, I sometimes you'll see me laying on the ground <laughs> to get an extreme angle That's just to fun. really change that. Or climbing on top of things. I've been known to climb on top of phone booths when those existed and trash cans and whatever it is <laughs> to get exist. to get high. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yeah. So like when you're like um, maybe with your friend and you want someone to take a photo of you and you have no choice but to like ask the stranger and like obviously mm -hmm. like the results can be very varied. Do you have any tips for like um, really easy direction that, mm -hmm. yes. that people understand? Okay, so mm -hmm. take all the tips that we just did, the lighting, the perspective, all of that. Get your, like figure out exactly, okay, this is exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. Then you tell that person like, thank you so much for being willing to take this photo for me. Can you take it right here, exactly like this? Mm. Take it exactly like this, oh, and yeah. or, or like show them exactly what to do. Be like, take it right mm -hmm. here. Don't move the phone, and t tell them to also take multiple. Be like, don't just take one. Take like ten. I like doing mm -hmm. a lot. I like options, um, and that way you can they'll like hit the button many yeah. times. So like you can do different poses, but also if they're like unsteady or whatever, at least one of those ten will probably work out. Mm -hmm. That's what I and the same tips for kids because a stranger may not be reliable so turn off live turn off mm -hmm. you know HDR turn off like unless it's it's necessary for the scene like mm -hmm. take all the room for error out. How do you turn off the live? Um, it is actually that little so dot at the top of the screen it's like a dot surrounded camera? by a dot. What's mm -hmm. that? Yes. Yeah. It's so a the thing camera. right in the middle. It's the dot right with yeah. dots around it. It's yellow when it's on, it's white when it's off. And then HDR is right next to it. Yeah. 
HDR is an incredibly awesome tool. Definitely experiment with using it, especially when you're taking a picture of like subjects in front of a sunset. That's like a perfect time, or a sunset in general. But when you're doing a regular, especially a motion photo or whatever, turn off HDR. So it's, it's high definition resolution? No, HDR is actually high dynamic range, which means it's capturing like, like multiple images, which is why it always, um, it's, it's basically one on one. Yeah, it's taking like the three different exposures within a ser oh. short series of time so and then combining it into one. Off. But it's similarly yeah. because there's like a half a second between each image that it takes. If the subject moves or if the camera operator moves, the image won't be crisp. And, and you wouldn't do it all the time because the, the image is very really heavy. The image is heavier. Thank you so much. The image is heavier, but also. Um, it's that movement factor. So most people, it's it's not about storage, why? Because they're not that much bigger. Okay. Uh, it's really more about if it's moving, you don't. If see. anybody's moving, if the subject's moving, or if the photographer is has, if there's a user error of movement, the image isn't going to look good. It's the camera won't be able there, to process it. I just it. looked at that. There's an auto setting on mm -hmm. it, so that it decides. It decides for you. For you. It decides whether it needs it or not. So like if you. If it's sunset and you have this beautiful painted sky and HDR was off, the camera is probably, it's going to pick to either expose for the value of the sky or expose for the mm -hmm. foreground, which there's going to be more shadow, more light. <clears throat> so either the sky is going to just be all white and the ground's going to, you're going to be able to see the ground or vice versa, the sky's going to have all the color and the ground is just going to be like almost pitch black. So by turning the HDR on, it's going to take three images, one that exposes for the ground, one that exposes for the sky, and one sort of like halfway in between, and then sandwich them together in one image, then you can see all the beautiful color. So it's a really, really awesome, powerful tool mm -hmm. that is built into your phone. So if you're taking a picture of a sunset, skyline, anything like that, definitely utilize it. So is it related to the yellow squares that come up? What yellow squares? Oh, no, yeah, those are, that's cool. different. That's Yeah, it is related to that because that is both focused and exposure. This is actually a good trick since you guys are still hanging in here. Um, in terms of that, let me go into the camera setting. So you get those yellow squares, whether it's in HDR or not. Yeah, so basically, you see that yellow square he, he's talking about? If you guys want to go, let me actually put a subject in there for it. And if you want to try to focus, yeah. So kids here, and this is great because this is really bright, and so she's in shadow by comparison, right? So if I were trying to take a picture of her, the camera is going to try to make up its mind. It's trying to balance the difference be to, be between her Are face. Are HDR? No, that's okay. regular. Okay. So then if I turn HDR on, and then I tell it what to, to expose for, I'm going to expose for her face here. And did you guys see how I just held it down and it like flashed yellow at me? Do you see it here? It says AE slash AF lock, mm -hmm. auto exposure, auto focus lock. So the camera now has been told, stay focused and keep this exposure. And then what's really cool is once I do that, let me do it again here so you can see, I lock it. I can choose now whether to increase the exposure or reduce it. And it's not going to change. If you, you can do that without locking it, but if you move it even slightly, it may choose to adjust that for you. So that's why we use the lock, especially in the complicated lighting where you have really bright and really dark and you're trying to figure out Even if you move the phone just slightly, it's going to start re-exposing mm -hmm. and then you're like, ah, no, it just was perfect. Mm -hmm. So you have to do that tap to make it stay on that exact light. So again, you just hold it and then you'll see it flash and then that pops up and now I can adjust the exposure ever so slightly and then take the photo. And because it did HDR, that's the regular one, which this is a perfectly fine photo for her, right? Mm -hmm. But the background is pure white, whereas with this one, it attempted to get a little more detail in here. So there's a little bit of color. This is a really difficult example, but sunsets are the perfect place to experiment yeah. with this. I have one. I actually have oh, yeah. it up. So we were just at a wedding last weekend. So here you see, this is me and my boyfriend, but um, the sunset isn't quite as bright, but you can see us very clearly in this shot. Mm -hmm. So you can see the two bodies really clearly. Also, this was a, the most spectacular sunset. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the most painted sky. And it still looks seen. really pretty. The sunset still looks nice. But then if you scroll over, like we're darker, but the sunset's even, this has not been edited or anything, but you can see the sunset even mm -hmm. that much more cleaner, crisper, mm -hmm. brighter. Um, but we're a little bit darker. The, I would actually probably use this shot and then just edit it in Snapseed. Yeah. And, only edit being selective on our bodies to make that part lighter, but leave the sunset exactly as is. Pull that up in Snapseed. Okay. I want you guys to see one of the hidden tools in Snapseed and specifically, so once you've used HDR, right? And once you've locked it and gotten it to expose for both the sky and the subject and you've created this beautiful high dynamic range, it still needs a little bit of like zhuzh to, to 
recreate what we saw in real life. So recreate what the eye saw. So by taking this image, this is my favorite hidden tool. We go to, to an image right up here. And then it brings up this list of, of settings. And my favorite one is ambiance. And we increase the ambiance here. And can you see how it just like took yeah. that super next level? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, that right there might feel a little over the top. So I might come about halfway down and create sort of a, a more balanced level. And then the other thing I would do, because this is fun, is I would take selective. <laughs> I would tap on them so that it's selecting them. And then see it creates this like cloud area here. And I would just brighten them up a little bit. So by zooming back out, you can see we've now just created where they are bright and light. And the sunset, the, the before and after. So it was already good because we did all the steps in terms of a, you know, HDR, exposing for their face, doing the lock, and getting a great image to begin with, and then we elevated the image. So, and that's, honestly, because I was there, like, that's what it felt like, that's what it looked like. So that's, our goal mm -hmm. is to recreate the emotion of what we saw in real life, not necessarily, like, pixel by pixel, exactly the same. Yeah. So, so in HDR, you'll actually see multiple pictures taken so or? it'll give you two it'll give you two. the plain one for how you exposed for it in the camera right. so that single shot but then it's also going to give you the hdr which is the sandwich images okay. it does like automatically does an algorithm of like negative compensation right. positive compensation and sandwiches it great yeah you. you're welcome okay. do we have any other questions we have a couple more minutes if anybody wants to ask anything else do you feel like you guys are or you can come up after too. Feel free. <laughs> and if you want to talk to us more, take our card. We left them out here. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Follow us on Instagram. Thank you.